I'm Zach Corser, co-director of the Policy Lab, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Maya Kandel, who's visiting uh, from Paris to talk to us today about populism. Maya is a French historian. She's an associate researcher at the Université Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris III, specializing in U.S. foreign policy and defense issues, the U.S. Congress and transatlantic relations. Since 2017, she has led the U.S. and transatlantic issues at the policy planning staff of the French Ministry of European and Foreign Affairs. She has advised President Emmanuel Macron on these issues. Um, and from just before this, from 2011 to 2016, she had another position in uh, the French government as the program director and senior researcher on the United States at the French Institute for Strategic Research. So Maya has a great deal of uh, experience in um, understanding both America and the United States and its politics in relation to Europe and France in particular. Um, so she brings a, a very rich and unique experience in talking about particular, the subject of her talk today, populism. She's also a graduate of Sciences Po Paris and of Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. She's written extensively on these subjects for academic as well as general public publications. Um, I'm also happy to say that she is a contributor to an upcoming edited volume that I've put together called Democratic Discontent, How Populism is Reshaping Politics in Europe and America. Uh, professors Helland and uh, Thomas are also contributors to this volume. So it's, it's a pleasure to see Maya and invite her back to Claremont. So please give her a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Zach, for the invitation, for, for getting to know Claremont um, last year and again this year, and for inviting me to um, join the Tocqueville project that you just uh, mentioned. And that was uh, shortly after we met in Lyon a little over three years ago. And I just want to mention that, and I told Zach already, but we met at a conference uh, just at the start of the uh, primary season, uh, American primary season for the US election uh, in 2016. And um, you gave the most interesting presentation on Donald Trump. And I have to say that helped me to take Donald Trump seriously from the beginning. And that is something uh, I think uh, has helped in my career and has helped me uh, land my current job, which I love. and. Uh, helped me also uh, meet uh, President Macron uh, and, and, and advise him on, on his uh, interactions with Donald Trump, even though that didn't work out too well in the end. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but I have, and, and that's where I just have to say that our views here are my own and don't represent the official position of the French MFA, which is the nice part of uh, being at uh, policy planning. And um, no, the other thing I wanted to say that the, the Tocqueville project uh, made me focus on a particular aspect of populism, on, on the impact of on foreign policy, and uh, also the, ter the transatlantic dimension. And this really has uh, turned out to be uh, one of, I mean, probably the heart of my work uh, for the first year I was at the at, at policy planning, and. Uh, to try to understand how the new wave of, of populist leaders could impact foreign policies and international relations, and how the transatlantic dimension was key to understand that. So it was interesting because it, the phenomenon was developing in, in US and Europe. Um, so I, I, I had uh, real-time case studies. Uh, I could test hypotheses um, so, and do scenarios, which is what we do a lot at, at policy planning. And my primary um, hypothesis was that populist leaders developed an alternative vision of international relations that was both a criticism and a, a criticism of and a counter proposal to the existing uh, international order or liberal international order, um, the LIO for like uh, IR. Um, specialist, uh, which is uh, now in crisis. And put differently, and, and that has been undergoing, but I think it's quite clear now, it's also a, a populist counter proposal based on a crusade for illiberal democracy. And I'll get into that uh, 
uh, in more details. And my focus on transatlantic relations also helped me notice early on the importance of transatlantic circulation of ideas. Um, on the right, uh, cross-pollination, I don't know if that works in English, um, and in particular how theories that were first developed by French intellectuals uh, in the 70s, in the 1970s, has, had spread, and how there was a common uh, Russian matrix uh, in, to Europe's populist parties, especially on the right, but not only. Um, and then the th third point is that uh, this alternative vision gained traction with the election of Donald Trump here, uh, and that's a testimony to the to U.S. soft power, actually, um, and the power of the U.S. presidency. So this is not to say that there is a populist foreign policy. There isn't, but I would argue that um, foreign affairs, in a in a in a large sense, a country's relation to uh, the world is uh, the area where populists converge most. And uh, this convergence has led to uh, the development of a nar nar narrative uh, that has gained uh, increasing traction. And it's, it's a counter-proposal that, that has been pushed by Russia for a while, but also uh, by, by China. Now, Last month, I don't know how much the last month's terrorist attack at Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, how much that was covered uh, here. It was extensively covered in France uh, on one aspect in particular because it gave one example of the transatlantic circulations that I'm referring to, and I can talk about it later. But I'm gonna, I want to start with an example um, that has to do with France and the Yellow Vest and the US website InfoWars and Russian public diplomacy or propaganda uh, through its uh, state-sponsored uh, news channel, uh, Russia Today, R RT, which has a big audience in France. And then I'll try to show how European populists uh, view the world, what it means for Europe, uh, and why the European Parliament elections uh, matter. <clears throat> and my point, uh, I guess, which is maybe a, just a little less ambitious than the summary I had sent, is that uh, the popular framing in Europe and the US, which opposes uh, anti and pro-Europeans, is too simplistic and it's not really helpful. Uh, and because first Brexit, we just talked about it, but also uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary, and I'm simplifying, but have changed the, the terms of the, of the debate. So the first, uh, my first point, um, I want to just talk briefly of an alleged plot of a military coup and civil war in France, Alex Jones, and Russia today. And that's really to illustrate these transatlantic circulations. And it's important because it's, it's, a, it's a story of the most discussed and shared article on social media in France in the second half of December, which was just before Christmas, which was really at the height of the uh, Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Vest movement. And it's really, it's, it's an example of how contemporary misinformation spreads, and I'm sure you, you all are aware of this problem, but it's, it's mostly, it's a vivid illustration of, of what I'm talking about. So um, let me try to describe it. So it all started with uh, a short letter written by, uh, written on an, an obscure, posted on an obscure French blog by a handful of equally obscure uh, retired generals, including one who had been fired from the military and another who had been fired from the political party he had joined after his retirement of the military. And so really something not important that no one would have noticed. The letter was exhumed by Paul Joseph Watson, so I don't know if you, you know who that is, but he's someone who works for the website uh, InfoWars of Alex Jones. He translated the, the post into English and presented it as a scoop showing that dozens of, uh, quote, uh, dozens of generals, including a former defense ministry, that was false, accused Macron of treason and threatened of a military coup. And the subheading of the article was that French people have another good reason to revolt. Um, and from there, it was picked up by the Russian TV uh, station, Russia Today, 
Uh, I don't know if you know of this station here. It's in France. Uh, it broadcasts in French, and it has uh, quite an audience because it's been able to pick up some celeb former celebrities uh, from French national TV. And uh, it's especially it has broadened its audience with the uh, Yellow Vest movement. And uh, RT twisted it again and presented it as the clearest sign that France was on the verge of a civil war and that the French had really you know, ample justification to revolt and destroy uh, the Champs-Élysées and whatever they wanted to. So just for context also, it's important to know that the Yellow Vest movement, which I'm sure you've heard about, um, was extensively, probably too, way too much, uh, covered from the start by many uh, media in France, by 24-hour cable TV, uh, including RT. But RT journalists did it a little differently. They gave extensive airtime to the most extreme and conspiracy-minded uh, members of the movement. So they really created the, the leaders, so-called leaders of the movement, and um, covered the destructions as justified reactions to police brutality and Macron's dictatorial government, uh, it's not, uh, and to economic hardship and inequalities. And what's interesting is that very, uh, so very early on, uh, the Yellow Vests have attacked the media, they have uh, physically assaulted journalists, except RT journalists. And they were claiming that uh, very early on from the first act of the, of the movement that RT was the only media that was covering them fairly and that the others were enemy of the people, which sounds familiar. And so to go back to the military coup piece that I was referring to, uh, RT France was what helped the article go viral. And it really became viral, as I said, it became the most shared and discussed article um, because RT promoted it on, the, on, on its uh, social networks. And then it was picked up from there by what we called the, the facho sphere, uh, which is basically the uh, um, interconnected web of uh, extreme right, radical right blogs, and social and Facebook groups, uh, and you know the yellow yellow vest was a movement that has been organizing really through Facebook groups, and um, basically the, the 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 purpose was to. Um, Prove that Macron was behaving like a dictator, and that was that had provoked this legitimate reaction of the military. Again, globalizing all that, and another clear objective, which is an objective of RT, of RT clearly, uh, was to further sow discord and infuriate the yellow vests, which worked. Um, and Anyway, I think it's interesting to show how these uh, things circulate, and it, actually the same thing had happened, I could have used that article, the same thing had happened with the Macron leaks uh, just before the French presidential election with a fabricated misinformation that was traced back to Russia and that was first spread by Jack Posobiec, who's a, also a notorious uh, person on the uh, uh, rights here in the US and then spread through all these webs in, in, in France. Um, so I hope that was interesting. Uh, I think it's very illustrative. And now I, I'll get back to the, to the European uh, elections. So how, uh, how European populists view the world, what it means for Europe, and, and why uh, the European Parliament elections matter. So. The stakes are really unusually high in this election. Uh, several serious studies have showed that European populists uh, are on the way to winning between one-third and even perhaps half of, uh, of seats in the next European Parliament, which would put them in a position to influence or to block key decisions uh, for European citizens and, and the evolution of the, the European project. Of course, if Brexit gets delayed, um, then the UK has members and that changes everything again. So the Brexit is really making our life uh, 
complicated, uh, and that includes <laughs> this. But anyway, that was a parenthesis. No, because because the Brit uh, UK has many seats because the it, the way it functions, it's like the House of Representatives, so it's proportional to the population. And the forecast is rather that uh, the Labour Party would have many uh, seats, and so that could make the Socialist group actually the first group, which is totally not the scenario right now without. Uh, Britain participating in the election. Um, so the European Parliament has become more powerful since the 2007 Lisbon Treaty. Uh, one the, the example probably you know uh, here is the EU uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation on uh, the rules on, on uh, European citizens' data storage, privacy, and use. And um, but but I won't. I, I'm not going to get into details of how EU policy is is made because it's it's a nice day and a nice lunch and I don't want to lose you all. Um, but more importantly, um, the ideological fight between uh, liberal democracy and and this populist country proposal, a liberal democracy is global. So I, I really think a good showing uh, for populists would influence other national elections in Europe. There are many uh, national elections also in Europe. Uh, and, and also wait on the, the, cur the, the current partisan reorganization uh, underway in many European countries. And uh, that's where I mentioned the popular framing of uh, pro versus anti-European uh, doesn't work. Um, we discussed it with uh, a table t uh, just before, but uh, basically Brexit has made exiting the EU much less appealing today. And, um, and now, uh, so several populist parties want to also, they're conscious of their uh, rising power uh, and appeal with with voters and so they want to transform the EU from the inside rather than exit it and, and that's really a, a, a recent and significant development in France for example uh, Frexit used to be a thing you know for the the French Front National which is now called uh, Rassemblement National and it's not anymore. They, they don't, they, it's not part of their program anymore. And so actually there is a dissident group that left uh, that is uh, defending Frexit as their program, but Marine Le Pen uh, is not anymore for the, for the Front National. Um, and so, so that's one point. And, and the second uh, important uh, aspect is that uh, foreign policy is really one area where uh, populists from the left and the right, I'm focusing more on the right because just they have more power, but it's interesting to see that, that populists on the left and on the right actually uh, share a similar uh, vision, if not identical positions on all issues. And they, are, they, they have actually uh, joined forces already, whether on migration, uh, on, on the rule of law, on trade issues, on sanctions. So it's, it's really interesting to, to, to see that. And um, finally, uh, the most elaborate uh, counterproposal, as I said, came from uh, Viktor Orban, who actually had uh, uh, gave a speech last year, a foreign policy speech, uh, where he officially and emphatically embraced a liberal democracy. And I'll say a few things uh, about that, but um, just to, to give just a little bit of structure here, um, the defining characteristics of populism, um, how, how, how do they impact foreign policy positions? Basically, the, f the fixation on control and sovereignty and the opposition between a pure people and global elite, which are the defining uh, features of populism, translate in foreign policy um, with the rejection of any uh, supranational authority, uh, of international institutions and norms, and of multilateralism in general. But more, more importantly, I think, it's it tr contemporary populism discourse in, in Europe on foreign policy is really built, uh, or not even just on foreign policy, it, it's really built on a criticism of economic and, and cultural globalization, and I think that would be true here as well. And it's basically the rejection of the dominant Western narrative of the end of the Cold War embodied by uh, Fukuyama's article on the end of history. And um, you know that 
that inspired Bill Clinton's uh, foreign policy doctrine of an enlargement of the world's uh, free, uh, what was the formula, quote, enlargement of the world's free community of market democracy. So that's why you have all these uh, many papers uh, now in, in France and notes are always entitled uh, the end of the post-Cold War era. And I think that's a very uh, uh, pertinent uh, way to put it. So you probably know that Steve Bannon, after leaving the White House and getting fired from Breitbart, attempted to unite uh, European populists on the right. That didn't work uh, out so well. But, um, and, and on that I've seen papers uh, uh, that seem to, 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 to argue that, uh, you know, Steve Bannon helped uh, European populists define their nationalist or their nationalism and things like that. That's just absurd. Um, and in reality, if, if something has influence, if there is one common influence, it's uh, Russia. And um, there really is a Russian uh, matrix. So I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit how that has worked. First is that uh, Russian money has been financing political parties on the right uh, for a while in Europe. And there, there are proofs of that. And uh, for example, in France, Marine Le Pen has admitted it. Um, there, the, it uh, there's, there are proof of that that came out recently for uh, Matteo Salvini, who's the uh, leader. Uh, he was a, a Italian deputy prime minister, uh, leader of the League, and was elected last summer. Um, and all these leaders have been uh, meeting for a while. Putin met with Salvini in 2014 on a big uh, conference on Eurasia. That's no coincidence either. Uh, it's a program, Eurasia is a program. Um, he, uh, he supported Marine Le Pen also. Well, first he supported uh, Francois Fillon, who, who was another candidate. But anyway, he supported Marine Le Pen and, and, and the whole uh, um, Russian propaganda machine supported her. There was a hashtag, Je vote Marine, uh, selfies with Putin and all that. So, so there is a very direct influence. And then there is also uh, the fact that European populists on the right have been taking a, a more pro-Russian turn as uh, Russia has come to embody values that these parties uh, defend, like nationalism, like uh, traditionalism, Christian values. So, um, so it's no coincidence that this global like, foreign policy uh, narrative, uh, one way to, to understand it is to go back to a speech that um, Vladimir Putin gave in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference, which is a big conference on uh, foreign policy defense issues uh, in Europe. And it was really the, the launch of the, this newly aggressive Russian foreign policy that was just one year, if you recall, one year before uh, the annexation of, uh, or not really annexation, but Russian operation in Georgia in the summer of 2008, and then you had Crimea and Ukraine. And you really have this, I mean, you can see the, this growing influence of Russia in the positions of uh, populist parties in Europe on Syria, uh, you could see it on the EU, on China, on the US, obviously. Um, but the, the, the philosophical uh, or theoretical uh, um, aspects of it had, had much older intellectual roots in Europe, especially in, in the French uh, Nouvelle Droite, which is a movement that started in the 1970s. Um, and it had one intellectual father who is Alain de Benoit, who's uh, considered as the father of traditionalism and had many connections to Alexander Dugin, who's uh, someone who's close to Putin, a little less now apparently, but was also influential in, in changing uh, Russian foreign policy. And Alain de Benoit was completely forgotten in the 80s and, and made a comeback and now is this like new figure incubator of the new generation of uh, populists on the right, not only in France actually, but uh, also in, in, in Europe. And the, basically his uh, thinking that you find also in, in Putin and in Russian foreign policy today is to defend uh, realpolitik as opposed to the liberal international orders, 
th that was built by the U.S. after 1945. It defends sovereignty and nationalism as opposed to multilateralism and international cooperation. And basically, it's an, it's an attack on the foundation of the liberal international order. And in this whole like intellectual family, you also have uh, younger intellectuals, uh, some of which you might have heard of, like Renaud Camus, who is the father of the great replacement theory that has been circulated a lot. It was in the manifesto of the terrorists uh, of Christchurch recently. Um, I read articles about, uh, the, um, mentioning slogans uh, during the Charlottesville demonstration uh, last summer they, that was saying, you, you will not replace us. Well, all that started with Renaud Camus and, and his uh, writing. The, he wrote a book uh, 10 years ago called Le Grand Remplacement, The Great Replacement. And what's interesting is that the election of Donald Trump to the US presidency has given more traction to some aspects um, of, of what I just mentioned, you know, uh, sovereignty, nationalism, opposition to international institutions, um, and was applauded as such by these populist leaders in, in Europe, in, in Poland, in Hungary, in Austria, um, and, you know, you really see the, the, this soft power of another kind uh, being, uh, you know, rev reverberate across the globe. You have uh, leaders from Egypt and Turkey to Nigeria and the Philippines actually quoting Trump to uh, justify their foreign policies. But I see that time is running. so. Let me say a few words of uh, the other very articulated position in that, which is uh, Viktor Orban uh, speech and uh, his crusade now, open crusade for illiberal democracy, which is now at the heart of the new populist creed in, in Europe. So in July of 2018, last year, uh, Orban gave a big foreign policy speech where he uh, embraced his, uh, illiberal democracy. So I'm going to quote him a little because it's very interesting. So he declared, quote, there is an alternative to liberal democracy. It is called Christian democracy. And it was a speech uh, on the current global battle of ideas. And he insisted that, quote, again, Christian democracy is not about defending uh, religious articles of faith, but about protecting the ways of life springing from Christian culture, human dignity, the family, and the nation. And he went from there to declare Christian democracy illiberal by opposition to liberal democracy. And he justified this opposition by uh, mentioning three key issues. Uh, one, liberal democracy favors multiculturalism, uh, while Christian democracy gives priority to Christian culture. I'm quoting uh, all that. Two, liberal democracy is pro-immigration and open borders, while Christian democracy is anti-immigration. And three, uh, liberal democracy sides with adaptable family models rather than the Christian family models model. And the, uh, the, the, the other, the, the important point, uh, very Samuel Huntingtonian tone of the, of the speech was that uh, Christian uh, democracy uh, is the way to fight uh, against Islam. And so I think it's, it's very important. Uh, this, this speech was key to understand. I'm using Orban, but you find the same thing in Sebastian Kurz, the leader of Austria, uh, Matteo Salvini also, um, and uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, who's another Le Pen, uh, also in the uh, Rassemblement National in France. Um, and basically, it's a movement now that you see that makes uh, support for liberal democracy seem inseparable from support for multiculturalism, open immigration policies, non-traditional family structures. And you really have this new coalition on the right uh, emerging in Europe um, by attracting members of another growing movement. And I'm using, and there I'm, I'll use a, a, a more American expression, the anti-PC warriors, because we have them also in Europe. And, um, and, and that's how the, the right is reconstructing, uh, because many of them come from the left. 
actually. And they've been alienated by leftist parties' defense of minorities uh, in general. And, and in France, you have Le, Le Printemps Républicain, which is uh, completely uh, representative of that. And so, I, I, as I said, I use Orban, but you had recently Salvini's League had been, um, has been referring suddenly, increasingly, to the defense of Western civilization and very visibly and symbolically enrolling the most traditionalist uh, elements from the Catholic Church. And again, that's, so that's interesting because all of these parties, Arben's party, Salvini's parties, party, existed before, but they're really changing. So for example, Salvini, his party used to be called the Northern League, and it was very much about, uh, against Southern Italy and had very difficult relation with the church, with the Catholic Church. So, and, and in France, you see basically Marion Maréchal Le Pen is devoted to, to working with, to, to getting the, cat, the most traditionalist elements of the Catholic Church with the Rassemblement National. And, and you see that all over uh, Europe. And of course, another thing that's interesting uh, is that, um, so they're all using liberal in the American sense, actually, uh, and opposing, uh, um, you know, uh, as meaning uh, progressive to, as opposed to conservative. But this confusion, and that's where I think, you know, uh, that uh, basically this confusion did not start with Orban. You have a, a procedure underway in Europe. You have this Article 7 procedure. Um, on, um, on the rule of law, and um, two years ago there was a report, the Sargentini report from the Euro European Parliament, which was the basis for a procedure against Orban's attack against the rule of law uh, in his country. Um, basically, the attacks again, um, you know, Hungary's authoritarian slide uh, on pluralism, on the justice system, on education, on the media. and. The report actually blended uh, this authoritarian slide with uh, attacks on uh, Hungary's immigration policy and treatment of sexual minorities. So um, this has obscured the meaning of the Article 7 uh, procedure, and it's really unfortunate because on both sides you have uh, this blurring of the lines between authoritarian impulses and social conservatism. Um, so all that is to say that this is no ordinary European election and I don't have enough time to, to, um, to detail the, the, the kind of impact, but I'll just come back to, uh, to Russia because I know it's a complicated issue here uh, in the US, um, but I think it's important to stress that what matters more than interference in elections and even more than Russian money financing political parties uh, in Europe is how this narrative that is coming from Russia is gaining momentum on the political right on uh, both sides of the Atlantic. And actually, Vladislav Surkov, who is the founder of Russia uh, United, uh, Putin's party, uh, he was quoted in, in Le Monde last week uh, saying, uh, politicians worry about Russian interference in their elections. In reality, Russia is interfering with their brain. And I mean, I think it's very uh, telling that, that he said that. And as I said, so that's the part that I wanted to um, talk about and I won't have time, but the ultimate objective of, of Putin is to redefine Europe as part of, as, the, as Eurasia, to detach it from uh, the Euro-Atlantic space, which has characterized the West for the past century. And, um, you know, Putin has Russia's interests in mind, and Russia's interests are always to have divided and weak neighbors. Uh, and what's important today is that China has similar objectives for maybe somewhat different reasons, but it also wants to have a divided uh, Europe. And ultimately, you know, both countries who have an increasing strategic partnership, no matter how much we want to, we would like to argue differently, uh, they do have a close strategic, a closer strategic partnership. And 
uh, I think they would be happy by if the EU and NATO uh, did not exist anymore. And I'll finish on that. Um, one thing that strikes me is that this evolution might actually suit a growing portion of the American public as well. Um, with many people, you know, tired of uh, seeing the U.S. finance the defense of rich Europeans through NATO, uh, and you see the U.S. foreign policy establishment is, is really turning its uh, attention to China. So we might be, we, we are in the process of perhaps reaching a, a tipping point uh, on that, and uh, that's why I think the, the results of uh, European election will be interesting uh, to follow. And, and I'm done with that. Thank you.